I want to capture an essence of how you, as a chairman of a domestic bank, view uh, the economy of India and the impact that the foreign inflows is having yeah. on the economy of India. How would you read um, how India is developing today? No, the way I look at India, uh, it's a, a country uh, which is being rebuilt. It's a very interesting country today. Um, you go to any part of the country, there's a huge amount of activity taking place. Airports are very good. Small, small centers. You visit, I, 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 mean, I went to Mangalore uh, a month back, which is, which is where my career was built. But it is a, with a gap of about one and a half years. In New Airport, you find ports being built. The roads are built. Whole amount of investment taking place in infrastructure, the huge amount of uh, migration taking place to urban cities, the urbanization in its uh, peak happening. Now, education, the pressure on the education, pressure on so many things. So, what you are really seeing is a country in its uh, you know rebuild situation. So, um, when economy grows. It is given, you know, if you have a good governance, country, this economy will grow at about 10%. If you have some, you know, handicap that, because it's a democracy, I mean, anything can happen, then you have 1-2% less. But in a medium-term basis, 20-30 years, the growth is set. In such situation, the banking sector, which is a, you know, reflection of the economy, the key challenge is to create capacity. And that is where, uh, you know, the foreign flows gets into. I mean, it, it, it's an opportunity which any foreign investor should look at. There are issues. There are issues with the government. There are issues with uh, approvals. But then there are huge amount of opportunities. They're not being sorted out. But the fact of the matter is, the one who is looking at the country, one who would like to invest in the country, is the best time. Let's for the foreign investor coming in, but how much of this development is the average man on the street in India uh, benefiting from um, uh, education levels still remain low, health care, mortality rate, um, there's a lot of yes. work to be done on that front yes. uh, and it seems that the corporate world in India is speaking one language right. and the social world is speaking another language today. Right. Um, you know, do you think that um, the corporate world's um, progress is sustainable if, if some of the social uh, indicators are not dealt with? Uh, I think let me put it slightly differently. Uh, in the last two years, the government, government's, uh, at this time the government is focusing on uh, inclusive growth agenda. The inclusive growth agenda encompasses the large number of those who were not touched with the uh, growth opportunity in the past. 37% of the government allocation is going for the social sector. In effect, it is uh, social security uh, being given in a slightly different form. If you go to a developed country, you find if you are um, uh, unemployed, you get a social security. Uh, I mean, Benefit, yeah. benefit. But here, it is 100 days of job that is being given, which is social security. You are actually giving employment. Why we have social security benefit? It's a totally in a different way. Look at the four major initiatives that came in. Right to education, right to information, right to employment. Now, this is the path-taking initiative, which will take reasonable number of time to have its impact. But I as a banker when I move in a village today, I clearly see the migration is coming down because there are 100 days uh, employment in a village. Look at the consumer um, you know, um, uh, uh, goods industry. Their maximum sale is taken from the rural markets. So there is a market getting opened up. One, now on the education side, it's a, it's a debatable question whether they are employable is a debatable question. There's a huge amount of emphasis to educate people. 
So, I mean, it's, as I said, it is a country in the making. A country under, uh, you know, uh, being rebuilt. Uh, but the intent is very clear to reach out all those who have not reached in the past. That is the reason I said, but the governance is very good. 10% vote is bound to happen because all of them are contributing to the growth process. The, you, you mentioned that Union Bank has a focus on retail banking. That's like the last five years. And in a way, that was the flavor of, this, of the time that uh, many, retail, many banks wanted to focus on the retail banking business. Do you see a need to also focus on the small business um, sector? And, and um, you know, what would you be yeah. doing? As a, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, we went through a major transformation process. Uh, started from 2007. The focus of transformation process was clearly focused on a few segments. The first retail segment, where we came up with the products, processes, um, and what we put in place what we call union loan points. We offer all the channels so that uh, the uh, new generation customer also feel comfortable while the branch as a channel is also uh, I mean, uh, offered by opening a large number of branches because the uh, I mean, present customers, they are more comfortable coming to the branches. We didn't want uh, to restrict on the uh, brick and mortar uh, branch and go only for the online. But we offered all the channels, this one for the retail. But we simultaneously focused on small and medium enterprise. We opened up what we call as a business banking branch, 250 of them, uh, located in uh, SME clusters, and uh, you know, improved the process by creating centralized processing teams. So that's another major focus on the small businesses, medium enterprise business. At the same time, we also focused on the large corporate, because it's also a major segment of ours. So we opened up what we call the large, cor large corporate vertical. <coughs> so the focus was on uh, all three uh, you know, group, because all three group are banking with us. But then technology was the uh, real enabler. And I think we, I mean, a clearly broad new technologies ahead of our competition. And more importantly, it's not uh, the technology which is being bought out, but we were able to uh, transmit into customer experience and offer services, uh, customizing the product offering using the technology. That's where the benefit that they grew to us. So even as you broaden your business base and use technology to reach out to a, a greater number of customers, and I'm sure that you're also doing work on the channel from um, a, an average commercial bank is only as good as its top 10 customers and all you need is uh, one bad loan uh, for, for your you know, biggest exposure and, and the story will, will be very, very different in that sense. Do you have such concerns? Uh, actually, the, uh, I mean, um, where exactly we actually give credit to our regulator is that um, our exposure to any group is not, uh, you know, it's also restricted based on our capital. So I can't lend, even if I want, a uh, substantial portion of our uh, you know, resources to one group. So it is restricted. But internal policy, we don't expose ourselves to any sector more than 20%. Even though we are focused on retail, retail, the maximum we, I mean, as a policy, we go is up to 20% of our portfolio. Uh, so too it's in the large corporate or the uh, you know, infrastructure. We capped it about 20 percent. So there's a very clear risk management uh, policies in place. So the top 20 uh, customers account for uh, a total exposure of about uh, 25 percent. And so you you are you're happy with the uh, loan books, but you you did see your NPLs go up a little bit in the last, last year or so. Yeah, last year. So where was that coming from? Yeah, this is uh, and it's very interesting because the technology also gave us an opportunity to bring in uh, a total transparency in the way the uh, NPS are identified. So we took that advantage uh, during this year. Second, we had an issue around uh, you know agricultural loan waiver, which was uh, announced by the government, and uh, the culminating uh, month was uh, sep and, I mean, September of this year, where uh, the agriculture relief scheme. Um, which was offered as a benefit where the payment has not come 
was recognized in NPO. Post uh, economic crisis, uh, those restructured account, the last date for uh, you know, restructured uh, period getting over was June. So all these uh, three development happened in one year. So I mean, uh, uh, that's how the NPO is one. Even then, uh, we had anticipated this. I had given the guidance that September 2010, the NPL will peak and start coming down. Now, NPL uh, as a percentage, gross NPL, was 2.79% in September, has come down to 2.68% in December, expected to come down to 2.40% in March. But post-2011, it is expected to steeply come down. My credit cost is expected to come down to 50%. Next year onwards. So this was uh, a uh, exceptional year as the NPL is concerned. With all these things, it is still at about 2.68.